to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Bible says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse number 23. We welcome you today to our fourth lesson in our series on Christianity start to finish. Today we're thinking about sin and salvation. What does the Bible say a person who's in sin has got to do to be saved and go to heaven. What a wonderful topic to discuss from the Word of God today. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast. If you don't have your Bible out and ready, we want you to locate your Bible, open it up on your app, and we're going to study the Word of God together in this series. As always, today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit one of their worship services, whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night, Wednesday for Bible study. You'd be an honored guest at any of their services. In fact, you'll find people there who have a deep love for God, who love His Word, and who more than anything want to help people go to heaven. And so please visit and check out the Lord's Church in your area. Friend, also here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, we have a wide variety of good Bible study material. We have audio lessons, video lessons, written material, transcripts, study questions, articles, just a plethora of good Bible study material, and it's all available to you free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, Christianity Start to Finish, Lesson Number 4, Sin to Salvation, you can go to our website, fill out a media request form. We can send you a digital download instantly, or if you need that on DVD or CD, we'd be happy to make that available to you as well. Also, friend, in our fast-paced world that we live in today, we want you to check out the Gospel of Christ app. It's available in your respective Play Store, both for the Apple and the Android, free download, great tool to keep up with what we're doing, check out our new videos, and a good way to study God's Word as our fast-paced world moves as well. And so we hope that you'll do that, and we encourage you to as well. Today we're thinking about the powerful subject of sin and salvation. We're thinking about it personally, and I want you to think personally about your spiritual condition. You see, my friend, it's sin that separates a man from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities and your sin, but your iniquities have separated you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, so that he will not hear. Imagine you've got man on one side and you've got God on the other and there is a separation between man and God being united. What caused that separation? Your sins have hid his face from you. For in the clear teaching of the Bible is that sin separates man from God. You see, sin is a transgression of the law. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, sin is violating or transgressing or going beyond what the law of God teaches. And it's my own choices. I, can, I don't have anybody to blame. It's my own choices that bring that. James 1, verses 14 through 15, sin and desire and lust, when it begins inside me, it causes death. And so my own temptations my own desires, my own bad choices is what brings sin into every person's life. 
But friends, sin is not only just a transgression of the law of God. Sin is also when we know what we ought to do that's right, and we omit that in our life. James 4, verse 17, James says, For him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. And so not just violating God's law, but knowing we ought to do something, knowing we ought to help, knowing we ought to worship, knowing that we ought to do these things, and a failure to do that is sin. And so, friend, as we think personally today, if you're of an accountable age, we ask you, have you sinned? Have you said or done things you know you shouldn't have done? Have you left things out that you know were the right thing to do and omitted those from your life? Well, here's what the Bible teaches. The clear teaching of the Bible is, like it or not, we've all done that. Romans 3 verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. None of us of an accountable age can say we're without sin. In fact, if we say that we're without sin, we make God a liar. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. The Bible teaches in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Someone once said, if all, then I. I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And friend, there's a terrible consequence to my sin and to yours if it's left unchecked. The Bible clearly teaches in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What price has to be paid when we commit sin? The wages of sin is death. We're talking about spiritual separation from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. How many sins must you commit to be separated from God? Just one. When we sin, we fall short of God's glory and we're separated from Almighty God. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10 says, Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. People who've done wrong, the unrighteous, they're not going to live with God in heaven. It separates us from his love and his mercy and his grace. In fact, Matthew 13 verses 40 through 42 teaches at the end, Jesus is going to separate the good from the bad. Those who've not obey the gospel and done right and live and die in sin are going to be separated eternally from Almighty God. But here's the good news. The Bible clearly teaches there's a way to be saved. Matthew 1 verse 19 through 21, you will call his name Jesus. He'll save his people from their sins. We can be justified freely by the blood of Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. And friend, those who obey God and those who do what he says can definitely be saved. Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up in heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. Well, who is going to go there? He who does the will of my Father in heaven. Will Jesus save those who do what he says? Absolutely. And so we've got to follow the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as we speak personally today, here's what we ask you to do. I want you to think about your own salvation experience. I want you to think about the question, what must I do to be saved? Answer these questions with me for yourself. If we were to ask you right now, are you saved? What would your answer be? Just a simple yes or no. Are you saved? Well, how are you saved? What things did you do? Uh, how do you know that you are saved? You may say, well, I read my Bible and this is what God said I had to do and I studied on that matter and I did what the Bible says. You may say somebody told me to put my hand on the TV and say this prayer I saved. Somebody told me to say the sinner's prayer and I saved. Again, we're just asking you to think about your own salvation experience. How were you saved? 
at what point in that conversion experience were you saved? Did you believe in Jesus and were you saved? Were you saved when somebody told you to put your hand on the TV or whatever it may have been? Again, just think about your own salvation experience. And then we would ask you, have you been baptized? Were you ever baptized as part of your conversion experience? Were you baptized by sprinkling, by pouring, or by immersion? Which of those three was a part of your salvation experience? And then, my friend, we just simply want you to answer, were you saved before or after you were baptized? And so, if somebody told you to say the sinner's prayer, you were saved, and two weeks later you're baptized, then in your mind you were saved after or before you were baptized. And so, I want you to think about, make those questions and answers crystal clear in your mind. That's all we're asking you to do. And now let's compare that. Let's compare those questions and answers of your conversion experience with what the Bible says people did in the New Testament, and let's see if the two match up. What are God's conditions for salvation? Well, friend, the Bible teaches that to be saved, one must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Notice this verse. John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What condition is stated here for salvation? Well, you've got to believe. God gave His only begotten Son that if we believe in Him, people can be saved. Now, is that an absolute necessity? Notice these words of Jesus in John 8, 24. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you will surely die in your sins. And so the condition is belief, and it is absolutely essential to be saved that you believe in Jesus that we can clearly see in our Bible today. The second step in God's plan of salvation is that people must repent. Acts chapter 17 Verse 30 and 31, truly, notice these words, truly, these times of ignorance God once overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And so, again, simply, what condition is stated here to be saved? God now commands all men everywhere to repent. And so, along with believing Jesus is the Son of God, repentance is also a condition. Is just being sorry for your sins, is that what repentance is about? No. 2 Corinthians 7 verses 9 through 10 says, Godly sorrow produces repentance. Godly, the Bible does not say godly sorrow is repentance. The Bible says godly sorrow produces repentance. Repentance is not merely being sorry for your sins. Repentance is changing the way you live. Does repentance demand that a sinner turn from his sin? Absolutely. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter said, repent and turn. We are not saying that a person is going to be perfect from now on, but I do my best to turn away from sin, make a 180 degree turn in my life and turn to God. Now, like with belief, is repentance absolutely essential to be saved? Notice what Jesus said in this verse on Luke 13, verse 3. Jesus said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Is it absolutely essential to be saved that I repent? Well, sure. And again, nobody's perfect. We're not claiming to be perfect. We're not saying you're going to live perfect from then on, but I am going to do my best every day to turn from sin and to turn to God. Third step in God's plan of salvation is you must confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Notice these words. Romans 10, verse 10. The Bible says, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, Confession is made 
unto salvation. Now, friend, we're not talking about going into a cubicle and confessing some sin. That's not what's being discussed. What Jesus taught us is what we should confess. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, there's what we're to do. Neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Like with the Ethiopian eunuch, who when Peter said, he said, hey, there's water, what hinders me? If you believe with all your heart. And he said, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8, 36 through 38. That's the content of what we're talking about confessing. Is that absolutely essential? Yeah, Jesus said it. You won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And so, yes, not only does a person have to believe and repent, they must also, with their mouth before men, confess Jesus as the Son of God. And then, my friend, the Bible teaches to be saved, one must be baptized. Look in your own Bible. 1 Peter chapter 3, I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 21. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Does this passage say, baptism does now also save us. Absolutely. And so the condition stated here is baptism. Now, like with all the rest of the conditions, can a person be saved if they're not baptized? Well, let's let Jesus answer that question. John 3 and verse 5. In the Bible, here's what the Word of God says. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where the saved are. The kingdom of God is where we're trying to go. Unless a person is born of water and born of the Spirit, he cannot enter God's kingdom. Baptism is absolutely essential to be saved. Now, let's show a couple other passages that mention that in a very clear way. There's a lot of confusion in our world on the subject of baptism, but in all honesty, the Bible is very clear on it when we just take the Word of God. Look in Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. The Word of God says in Mark chapter 16, verse number 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. What two things did Jesus say must be done to be saved? Not after you're saved or because you're saved, but to be saved. Jesus said we must believe and be baptized to be saved. And friend, that's clearly taught, not just here, but throughout the New Testament. Again, let me illustrate. I want you to see it in your own copy of the Bible. Look in Acts chapter 2, the first day of Pentecost, when they, for the very first time, preached the good news about salvation in Jesus. What were people told to do to be forgiven of sins and to be saved? Look in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter, the inspired apostle of God, told people then who already believed to be baptized, to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now that phrase, for the remission of sins, sometimes people construe that and say that's because of, but that won't work in the New Testament. When we let the Bible be its own best commentary, here's what we learn. Exact same phraseology. Matthew 26, 28. Jesus said this, this cup is my blood of the new covenant shed for many, listen now, for the remission of sins. Did Jesus shed his blood because people's sins were already forgiven or in order that for the forgiveness of sins? 
And friend, I think we can clearly see in both examples, those items are necessary to be forgiven. And that's the idea. Ephesians 1 verse 3 teaches us all spiritual blessings are in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 10 teaches us that salvation is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now I want you to imagine, imagine a circle here. That circle represents being in Christ. In this circle, we have all spiritual blessings. We have salvation that's in Christ. Here I am outside of Christ. How does a person get in Christ? Open your Bible to Galatians chapter 3. And I want you to notice what the scripture says in Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse number 27 with me. The Bible records these words. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. If I'm out, out here and I want to get in Christ, how do I get in there? As many of you as were baptized. The Bible teaches we are baptized into Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 27, Colossians 2, verse 12, Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. Now, friend, since God only accepts that baptism, one where one obeys the gospel, knowing what the Bible teaches, we need to be sure that we were baptized the way God says. That means going down into the water. Baptism of the Bible is not sprinkling or pouring. It's immersion. How do we know that? Well, there are four passages that clearly teach that idea. John 3, verse 23, the Bible says, John was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. The baptism of the Bible takes much water. Uh, Acts chapter 8, Philip and the eunuch are traveling down the road. He sees water in the distance. Hey, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? If you believe in all, Jesus in all your heart, you may. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Philip commands the chariot to be stopped. They both get down out of the chariot. They both go down the water. He baptizes him. He came up out of the water and he just went on his way rejoicing. Why, if it's just sprinkling or pouring, why not send somebody to get some water? Why they both get out of the chariot? Why they both go in the water? Why'd they go down and come up out of the water? Well, that's a clear picture of immersion. But probably two of the clearest are Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. You know, a lot of people ask, what would Jesus do? Well, here's what Jesus did. And coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. When Jesus was baptized, he came up, ek, literally out of the water. Now, to come up out of water, what must you first do? We got to go down into water. And so in the Bible, that's immersion. But here's one of the clearer ones. Romans 6, verses 3 through 5. Paul says, We are buried with Christ in baptism, where we contact his death. Now, I want you to think about baptism as a burial. That's the illustration the Bible uses. What happens at a graveside service? Well, you've got the body. They dig a hole in the ground. At the end, they'll place that body in the hole, covered on the bottom, covered on every side, covered on top. A burial is a complete engulfing in the ground. A burial in water is a complete immersion into the water. And so when we look to the Bible, God's word is very clear on that subject. And so here's what we ask you to think about personally today. Remember when we asked you those questions to consider about your own conversion experience? We want you to examine those two with these ideas in mind. Do you really, really love the Lord? John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. I can't say I love God and learn what God wants me to do and not do that. And so if we really love Jesus, we won't obey him. Do you really love him? Do you want to obey him? Since Jesus wants us to hear the word of God and believe in him, repent of sin, confess his name, and be baptized, immersed in water for the mission of his sins. If you've not done that, then friend, to really wear the name of Christ, you've got to obey his will. Ephesians 5.23 says, Jesus is the savior of the body. There's only one body, and that body is the church. You get into the church 
by being baptized into it. As many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves in by one spirit we're all baptized into that one body and so friend we want you to consider not only these ideas of loving God but I want you to consider the time factor these are not scare tactics but it is real do you know for certain how long you'll live if you died today where would you go Don't you want to go to heaven when you leave this life? The Bible says, what is your life but a vapor? Here for a little while, then it vanishes away. What does that remind us of? It reminds us of one key word that ought to rise to the top right now. Now is the accepted time. Now or today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not two weeks from now. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. And so, friend, we're asking you today, are you a child of God? When you stand before the almighty throne of God and books are open and another book is open, it's a book of life, and the dead are judged according to their sins, will you hear the words because you have obeyed the gospel because of the death of Jesus, because you tried to live right by God's grace and mercy, will you hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, or... Will you hear the words, depart from me, you workers of iniquity? If you've never obeyed the gospel, we beg you today to do that. Please visit the local congregation of the Church of Christ in your area. Contact us, write to us. We'd be glad to help you on this matter. And friend, our hope and prayer is that you are a Christian, or if you're not, that you'll become one. We beg that next time, please join us as we study together more about the gospel of Christ as we strive to glorify God and to help men and women go to heaven. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.